Hello everyone, my name is Avi Savar, I'm the president of Suzy, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to Breaking Through, a two-day virtual event focused on helping you develop, launch, market, and track your products with confidence. We have an incredible lineup of industry leaders joining us, including Jen McKnight, president and co-founder of Bright Future Foods and vice president at Post, Heather Faraday, VP, director of strategy of Concentric Health Experience, and Rochelle Reeder, VP of Strategy and Evaluation at Ad Council, as well as Susie's very own Will Cimarosa, who leads product strategy and innovation, Katie Cross, our Chief Customer Officer, and Mary Baker, who is Vice President of Market Research. It's a powerhouse group, and they're gonna unpack the product development lifecycle and zero in on how these leaders are guiding their brands and trying to break through in today's highly unpredictable market. Because let's be honest, in a battle for attention with constantly changing behavior and rapid adoption of new technology, breaking through is almost impossible. Let's start with the fact that everything we knew about consumer behavior was thrown out the window as a result of the pandemic. 50% of consumers say that they now have totally revised their purpose in life and what is important to them. Add to this that as a brand, you have less than eight seconds to capture a consumer's attention. This was actually 12 seconds a few years ago, and sadly, our attention spans are only shrinking further. And if you ask McKenzie, they will tell you that 19 out of 20 product innovations fail. This is backdropped by the pace of disruption, which is challenging every incumbent and every organization. The average lifespan of an S&P 500 company has decreased from 70 years in the 20s to just 15 years today. And that would be a pace that would lead half of the S&P 500 to be replaced in the next 10 years. It doesn't stop there. We all know interest rates are climbing, inflation is rising, global sanctions are setting the stage for a new Cold War. So the only new normal is that nothing is normal anymore. We haven't seen this kind of inflation since the 80s, and it's affecting organizations in almost every category. It's influencing everything from how they price to how they market, position, and package their products and services. And when you start to look at the impact of canceling Russia from the world economy, the most obvious place to look is energy, but it goes beyond just gas prices. Russia is a major contributor to the world's food supply, on top of which their raw materials go into things like fertilizer, whose prices are now skyrocketing, creating challenges for farmers all over the world and could potentially lead to global food shortages down the road. So even though it seems like we finally made it through the pandemic, we're still surrounded by uncertainty. We may not have the crystal ball that can predict the future, but at Suzy, we are committed to building the best consumer compass on the planet to help you navigate these uncharted waters. In fact, Suzy's mission as a company is to enable human understanding. And we do that for some of the largest brands in the world, across their enterprise, and throughout the entire commercialization funnel. This starts with foundational learning, understanding your consumers at their core, their attitudes and their behavior. Then using that learning to develop products that delight and business models that drive growth. Then taking those products to market with campaigns that drive awareness and brand equity, and finally, knowing if those pro products are resonating, how they're performing against the competition, and how effective their distribution is. We are doing this by building the research cloud of the future. For us, it starts with an integrated proprietary network of screened and verified consumers. Having our own audience sets the foundation for everything we do, including a disruptive pricing model that eliminates cost per response. The core of the stack integrates advanced qualitative and quantitative research tools into one system. A platform that is fast, easy to use, highly flexible, and designed specifically for the enterprise. And finally, solutions that bring together automation, technical support, and a research center of excellence to ensure that you get the most out of everything Suzy has to offer. Our customers don't just use us for quick turn research. Suzy is robust enough to power deeper projects and even longer term studies. As leaders in the space, we've been helping some of the largest brands successfully navigate uncharted waters for some time now. 
Suzy is powering insights across the funnel for leading tech platforms, consumer electronic brands, institutional banks, food and beverage companies, pharmaceutical companies, gaming companies, one of the largest social networks on the planet, and many, many more companies. And all those clients who've been with us from the beginning, they already know that we're committed to continuously improving our products. We eat our own dog food by listening to our customers and investing heavily in R&D. This year is no different. Our first priority is to bring improved survey design, targeting, and advanced analysis to level up our quantitative layer. We've already released piping for more advanced survey logic, and we're hard at work developing a new crosstabs explorer along with new action types like max diff, turf, and sequential monadic. We also plan to launch multi-person focus groups and asynchronous video responses to level up our quantitative layer. We are currently beta testing focus groups, and by the end of the year, we intend to launch a video open-ended action type to allow you to capture unmoderated asynchronous video at scale. And finally, we're expanding audiences to include more global markets and offer more global functionality, including the ability to easily launch global monadic surveys, preview global surveys, report across countries, and more. Of course, the reason we're doing all of this work is to help you break through so that you can be agile, effective, and make decisions with confidence. Okay, so I have taken up too much time already. Let's get in to the rest of the day. In a few minutes, Katie is going to take us on a journey through each of the research stages with our esteemed guests. But right now, I'm going to throw it over to Will Cimarosa to go deeper into the increasingly complex consumer marketplace and to talk about how using the product development lifecycle as a feedback loop to help you be a more efficient and effective researcher. Will, take it away. Thanks, Avi. We're excited to talk to you today about the challenges we all face as market researchers, specifically the challenges we're all facing as the marketplace that we work within becomes more complex. This complexity is increasing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this complexity makes it much harder for us to be confident about our insight approaches. Think about all the things that are continuously changing. You've got more and more retail channels every day. Media channels, ways to reach and talk to your consumer are increasing co constantly. The way consumers interact with those channels is always changing. The demographics of our country is, is becoming more diverse at an accelerated rate. And there's all kinds of socio and, and macroeconomic pressures that are impacting consumers in their day-to-day -day lives. In a world where things are changing consistently and at accelerated pace, it can create problems with how confident we are about the decision-making uh, process and the things that we contribute to overall brand growth strategies. And this isn't just a, a, a temporary problem, right? COVID was an example, but there's always going to be another challenge. We're already dealing with inflation, war, right? You don't, we don't know what the next issue is going to be, but as the marketplace becomes more dynamic and as consumer behavior changes at an accelerated pace, this isn't going to stop. We're going to continue to deal with these, these challenges and we need to accept this as a daily reality, right? Consumer behavior isn't going to suddenly become simpler overnight. You know, the world is becoming a more complex place. Dynamic times create the need for dynamic solutions. We believe that you can get to a place where you can actually create a consumer feedback loop that's going to build that confidence for you, right? Building a consumer feedback loop allows you to stay in touch with your consumer on a regular basis and understand all of the different dynamics that are impacting their behavior. What are some of the things you can do when you have that consumer feedback loop? Well, it really can impact four main pillars of market research, from foundational research to understanding who your consumer is, understanding the, the, the way that their different uh, need states are changing, understanding their attitudes and their behaviors as they change over time, and ultimately allowing you to measure size of prize. When it comes time to developing innovation for those consumers, you can actually leverage that foundational understanding to your advantage to develop the products and the brand propositions that delight both your current and your new category users. This is also very relevant to campaign research. When you have a fundamental understanding of who your consumer is and what drives their behavior, and you're updating that on a regular basis, it enables you to develop and launch campaigns that drive not just brand awareness, but create product demand and build brand equity. 
learning how to articulate the right message for the right consumer is something that is going to be best done if you keep in touch with who those consumers are and when you have a foundational understanding of what's driving their behavior. This also then lends very well to tracking research, which is gonna be critical as times continue to change. You're gonna to wanna to be able to track existing product lines, the innovations that you've launched, how effective is your campaign actually landing with these consumers? And ultimately it's about understanding in market effectiveness when that market is changing. This feedback loop should be continuous and really informing all four of these pillars of market research. So I'm excited now to introduce Katie Gross, our chief uh, customer officer. She's going to be speaking with uh, some key industry leaders today um, across these four pillars. Um, we'll be talking with Heather Faraday from Concentric Health about some of her foundational research and how she's developed a consumer feedback loop to stay in touch and understand who those consumers are. We'll be speaking with Jen McKnight from Bright Future Foods, who's going to talk to us about creating a feedback loop that informs an innovation pipeline. Um, Rochelle Reeder from the Ad Council is then going to be able to talk to us about how feedback loops can inform campaign research. And we're thrilled to have Mary Baker, our own from Suzy, to talk about how this is impacting the way we tr track brand performance. Off to you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Will. I am delighted to be here with you today interviewing industry experts on the different stages of the product development life cycle. Here at Suzy, we look at the life cycle through four stages, foundational learning, innovation pipeline, campaign development, and shopper support. And first up, we have the foundational learning stage. This is the, where we can understand who the consumer is in terms of demographics, attitudes, and behaviors. And walking us through her experience with foundational research is Heather Ferti, VP Director of Strategy at Concentric Health Experience. Welcome, Heather. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. All right, let's kick off today's chat by getting to know each other a little better. Heather, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at Concentric Health Experience? Absolutely. Uh, again, first, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, so I have a background in neuroscience. My research experience spans biotech, pharma, academia, and hospital research. So I've always been driven by two themes in my career and the work I do with clients. One, how people work, and two, having a digital first data mindset. Uh, the first, what makes people tick is central to digging deeper and asking more of the why. I've always been a curious person and that curiosity brought me to my role at Concentric Health Experience where my responsibilities as a strategist require me to constantly ask why. The second, my data first mindset was developed in my lab work across academia and biotech. In my current role with clients, having this analytics and R&D background gives me the confidence to walk into a room with clients and ask for the data, question the data, and drive business recommendations from the data. Awesome. And so how do you set up a foundational groundwork for your research? The usual instinct, uh, like I mentioned, is to first ask questions, get a feel for what the client is aiming to achieve, how the research may help fulfill those goals, research alternatives if they won't help fulfill the goals, and the eventual impact the research will have on the customer. Uh, will it help to shift our current business priorities? And if so, can we determine how our audience will feel about that change? The second is to then choose a partner based on their capabilities. Sometimes the client has a vendor in mind or even an in-house team, but Concentric has typically been responsible for the vetting process. So it's really fantastic to see what capabilities are out there in the space. The market is always growing and there is no shortage of innovation going on um, in market research. The third and final step, once you have chosen a vendor is to align on the structure of that research. Um, you know, through screener questions, what questions will be involved in formatting uh, those questions. Um, and then the time to create the research. And then what finally is the time to deployment? Um, and then once you deploy, it's really a watch and wait, uh, learn, learning game from there. Awesome. And so how do you then ensure that you're targeting the right consumer for your teams or for your clients? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, so we always work closely with our partners and the partners Concentric works with like Suzy or another partner like Relative Insight are smart, have strong capabilities and can jump right in 
um, to you know the conditions that we're working with. We we work with a breadth of conditions. You name it, we work on it. Um, so having very strong technical partners is critical to the success of our business. Uh, we always brief our partners on what our goals are, the condition state we are working with, and our audience. And by this point, we've carefully vetted the partner to understand how precise their targeting methodology goes. And with Susie in particular, it was no problem. Susie can give precise audiences, um, like people living with obesity or excess weight, with a particular BMI um, or prescription interest, which was really critical to, again, the success of our project. Yeah. Um, and so do you have any advice for someone that's setting up their consumer segments? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, ask what the client has and then start from scratch. Um, it's almost always better going in with a blank slate mind because you can go in unbiasedly. You can form your own insights off the information and then go back to clients and suggest why their current segments are not working and how they can be optimized or how they are working and how that data that you found backs up those segments. Okay, awesome. And I understand that you recently used Susie for insights on a patient study. Can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Yes, so the goal for our project was to showcase a strong understanding of the motivations and drivers that people living with excess weight or obesity have for losing weight. Um, their interest in new innovative solutions and ways of consuming particularly weight medication, um, how this interest varies across age groups, and how patients of different ages are compelled by intrinsic factors like health versus extrinsic factors like appearance or energy improvements. And ultimately, you know, the objectives, we're, we're looking to understand, again, those patient motivations um, to lose weight uh, their perceptions of medications, what their daily habits are, and what kind of healthcare professionals they're working with to manage their weight, and um, the best ways that you know they have of interacting with those healthcare professionals. Yeah. So specifically, kind of what types of questions did you ask to make sure that you were getting to the right insights that you needed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was beyond impressed by how quickly the SUSE team jumped right in to guide our team without any prior knowledge of the space. At least I did not, I do not think they had any prior knowledge. Uh, we structured questions in a way uh, that walks the respondent through the journey, starting with the historical length of time that they have um, had challenges managing their weight. Uh, you know, initial challenges or barriers with weight solutions, family history. And then we structured questions in the middle of the survey to focus on the present tense, their current goals, their beliefs around prescription weight products, and then their relationship with their doctor and other solutions they've tried. And then most importantly, you know, where they go for information, which provides insights as to how we can tap into them with our messaging. And then finally, we ended with the future questions about the theoretical products that, you know, that product that we were pitching to gauge their interest in that product. Great. How much time did you spend on that study? The study was incredibly fast. So we were working with a pitch deadline. Pitches are extremely expedited work sprints of one to two weeks. Um, and in week one, uh, we briefed Susie. We drafted the appropriate survey screener questions for our project. And then in week two, Susie proofed those questions. Um, they provided the necessary guidance on final adjustments and we deployed the survey. And I believe it was about two days, even I would venture to guess one day, um, we received responses from over 700 respondents and the Susie team provided us uh, additional to all of the responses we got, a full report of the outputs. And they did not just simply, you know, hand us that report. They really helped to dive into it with us and, um, you know, clarify any questions that we had and insights that we were gathering. So it was just a lot of um, collaboration and support that we felt from them throughout the process. Great. Um, was the speed of response important for this particular project? Uh, very, very important. Um, in pitches, there is no margin for error. And it's it's really a mindset of we need the data yesterday. Uh, and Su Susie delivered on that. Absolutely. Awesome. And what are your plans for the results? 
we proofed the results against hypotheses that we had previously made about our customers. Um, again, going back to you know our objective to learn about our, our customer and their motivations for weight loss. Um, you know, we with that data that we acquired, uh, we we normally want to first get the data and then form our insights. Um, that's that's traditionally what you what you want to do so that um, you know you are working from the numbers first and then forming those hypotheses. But in this case, it was actually the inverse. Um, we first formed the hypotheses through social listening platforms and then we uh, used Susie to really support those insights. And um, so <laughs> it was really a, a sort of cross your fingers game that that the data would back up our hypotheses. And um, and we were quite lucky that the data did support our hypotheses. And in fact, it, it supported uh, our hypotheses so well that um, once we incorporated that data into our pitch, uh, it helped us to win the client. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, so what advice would you give to others who are gearing up to launch their own research projects? Mm -hmm. uh, don't delay. Uh, jump right in. Um, research is really critical to all projects and questions you are trying to solve. Even if you think you already know the answer, you likely don't. I recently learned a great quote passed on by research pioneer Bob Mesta, um, whose mentor Taguchi once told him, there's way more unknown than there is known, and don't ever fool yourself that you know it all. Ever, because at some point in time, the moment you stop being humble is the moment you stop learning. So it's really, again, it's so important that even if your client has the information or they think they have the information or you think you know you, you know or have that information, that you continually question it and um, search for, for new data um, that can inform your, your points of view. Yeah, it's a great motto for life as well as market research. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And finally, what's going to give you confidence in the business decisions that you're making? Yes, that's a great question. Continuing to seek out partners like Susie, like Kantar, these data-centric, robust platforms that make research seamless and therefore fun. At the end of the day, learning about consumer behavior and why people do what they do should be fun. And what is more, learning about how to synthesize that data should be fun and accessible for everyone, regardless of if you have a math or analytics degree or not. Um, that accessibility component is so critical to um, the journey of that consumer behavior you know, analysis and, and again, having uh, enjoyment through that process. Um, so what I'm really confident in and looking forward to is the future of consumer research and the capabilities that are around the corner for marketers and strategists like me and my colleagues at Concentric Health Experience. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, Heather. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure chatting as well. All right. Now we've laid down our foundational framework. It's time to chat about the innovation pipeline stage of the product development life cycle. In this stage, we leverage foundational learning to develop products that delight our target consumers. And joining me with a story about how she did this is Jen McKnight, president and co-founder of Bright Future Foods. Welcome, Jen. Hi there, thanks for having me. Awesome. So you are the co-founder of Bright Future Foods, which is the maker of Early Foods. Can you tell us a little bit about Early Foods and your business model? Yeah, sure thing. So my co-founder and I, um, gosh, about almost three years ago now, uh, started with a pretty simple question of what if. Um, what if instead of just trying to be a little bit less bad or a little bit more environmentally friendly, we could go all the way to creating a food product that removed greenhouse gases from the air. So it started as, as a question. We weren't quite sure if we could do it, um, but through partnering with Colorado State University and some other experts in the field, we were actually able to develop the first climate positive uh, box of crackers and every single box removes greenhouse gases from the air. Amazing. Um, and so early foods is, is carbon negative. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that actually means? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and I think there's a lot of discussion, a lot of confusion, you know, there are a, there's a ton of great work being done out there uh, by a lot of companies to be uh, net zero by fill in the blank, 2030, 2040, 2050. 
um, you know, we have the luxury of being a new company of actually never being a net emitter. So we are actually better than net zero from day one. So we sequester CO2 on our farm. So we farm differently. We use regenerative farming practices, uh, plus uh, biogeospatial targeting and life cycle analysis. So I like to talk about kind of old school farming meets Star Wars is basically where we come together to identify the fields that have the best potential to sequester the most CO2. So we're able to validate that we are truly net negative on the farm, taking into account all the activities. Um, and then we're working hard on coming up with zero emissions baking, zero emissions transportation, zero emissions packaging, um, in the interim, we invest in other carbon projects to offset the rest of our process and bring us back to that on-farm level. That's fantastic. Um, and it's my understanding that you, that you would use Suzy to test flavors for your product. Can you walk us through that process? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, candidly used Suzy from day one when we weren't even sure what, uh, what space we wanted to play in all the way up into the point where we identified this technology and wanting to get to truly net, you know, better than net zero, uh, all the way up to now we're in market. Um, so I'm using you for a lot of our customer decks um, at Evaluate Points. So uh, when we were developing the product itself, um, I used you for flavor sorts. So we came up with good grief, probably 60 or 70 different potential flavors we could um, choose to launch within the cracker space. Uh, we also tested kind of in that same space, uh, product proposition. So price point, packaging, size, some of that standard concept work as well. That's great. Was there a clear flavor winner? You know, not shockingly, uh, for anybody who's in the food space, if you're in the savory area, you know, cheese is always the go-to flavor. And if you're in the sweet space, chocolate is always the go-to flavor. Um, so the, the first four flavors that we launched with, we decided actually uh, to do both sweet and savory, uh, which is a little unusual in, this, in the cracker category. Right now they're primarily savory, but we saw it as an opportunity to add incremental occasions. Um, so we launched with two savories, a cheddar and a sea salt, um, and two sweets, a chocolate and a salted caramel is actually the other one that rose to the top. Delicious, all of my favorite <laughs> flavors. <laughs> um, so what types of questions did you actually ask the audience? Yeah, so I, you know, within the flavor sort, um, we kind of ask forced preference. We did offer some opportunity for folks to write in. Um, we did it in a few different sets because um, at the time, I think your tools continued to evolve. Um, but we had to ask them in kind of different sets and we did a little bit of a, you know, basketball tourney style of like, okay, here are the leaders. Now let's take them to the next move, um, was how we approached the, the flavor side of things. Um, as we've been doing other product development work, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, potentially doing some custom products for different retailers. Uh, you know, we're able to screen for those retailer heavy shoppers or those retailer members and then um, go deeply into their attitudes and generally we'll do a control as well. Um, so we can start to identify not just overall preferences, but also where we see their shoppers or their members, um, perhaps spiking on a communication point or a packaging option um, or flavor. Yeah. Great. So it sounds like you'd polled the consumers to determine what story should actually carry the products. Were there actually any surprising results that came out from that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as we've gone through it, uh, by and large, you know, I think it, it's underscored a lot of the things that some of our other research uh, would reinforce, which is, is reassuring in its own manner. Uh, I think some of the things that might have surprised me a little bit, um, when we say carbon, and again, you, you know, this is always the danger when you work on a brand or a product 24 seven, you know exactly what you mean. Uh, but the consumer looking at it cold uh, always takes carbon to the automobile industry. I always thought that was a fascinating one. Uh, you can imagine that when you're a climate positive product and you have a really heavy tech backstory like we do, where we're talking about carbon sequestration on the farm in the oats that are inside this cracker, um, trying to come up with really telegraphic ways to communicate those RTVs or the reasons to believe can be challenging. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. 
imagine, I can imagine. Um, do you have any advice for other brands who are looking to become more sustainable? You know, at the risk of sounding like a Nike commercial, just do it. Because um, I think, you know, one of the things that's been really fascinating for me on this journey, because I, you know, I've been around for a while. You could probably see the gray hairs here. Uh, I've worked on a lot of consumer packaged goods brands. I've worked on some iconic brands. You know, I've, I've, I've been really lucky the brands I've been able to work on. This is the first one where we really birthed it from day one to have sustainability at the core of everything it does. And I think through that journey, there's a, you know, a few observations I would make. The first is, the vast majority of people out there really, really want to be part of the solution. They're just not quite sure what to do. So that's where I go with the Nike Just Do It piece, because it can be a challenging space to go into when you start to get into legal and regulatory and which standard are you following? And this standard is different than that standard. Um, so it can be a tough space to navigate um, as a business leader. And that's where I would say, you know, balance the idea of progress is better than perfection. I guarantee you, whatever you do, somebody is going to have a contradictory point to that. So do your research, keep moving it forward, and be really transparent with the consumer of where you are on that journey. Um, you're never going to have it perfect on day one. Just be really clear and bring them along. In fact, invite them to be part of the process because they want, they really do want to be part of the solution as well. Yeah, exactly. They want to feel heard for sure. And so my final question, what's going to give you confidence in your business decisions that you're making? Well, hopefully some really great in-store velocity data. <laughs> That's ultimately what I'm going for. Uh, yeah, you know, this has been really an interesting journey because um, you know, while we're owned by a big company, we're truly a startup. Um, and so as we think about our development journey, we've really had a balance using business judgment um, with using tools like yours. That's where it's been um, really helpful because you get very rapid input to was your business judgment on point or not. Um, and it gives you the chance to kind of get that immediate feedback. So I think for us, the, the proof honestly is in the, is in the data. Like when we get out there um, and put it in front of consumers, do they, first of all, are we in front of them? Did we get the distribution? And then when we're in front of them, did we communicate it in a way that's going to cause them to pick it up off the shelf? That's great. Well, thank you so much, Jen. What a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So for the next step, we're going to take a deeper look at campaign development, which is when you develop and launch campaigns that drive demand, awareness, and brand equity among your target consumers. And for this stage, I'm delighted to welcome Rochelle Reeder, VP Strategy and Evaluation of the Ad Council. Hello, Rochelle. Hello. So Rochelle, could you tell us a little bit more about your role at Ad Council? Yes, uh, so I am a VP of Strategy and Evaluation. Um, I'm the designated research person on several different campaigns at the Ad Council, which means essentially that whenever the campaign has questions about the issue, or the audience, or how the campaign is performing, I'm the one who is uh, designated with finding the answers. Awesome. All right. Well, I would love to hear a little bit more about the work um, in campaigns. Could you walk me through your development process? Yeah. So at the Ad Council, we have um, a process where we start by rooting ourselves in the research. Um, we do a lot of desk research, and then we make sure to talk with our target audiences to get all the insights we possibly can about the issue, the audience, um, motivations, barriers, anything that we need to know to go into writing um, a strategy with our partner agencies. Um, once we have a strategy, we go into the creative development process and create everything that you might see um, on TV, on a billboard, online. Um, and we use audience insights throughout that entire process to make sure that we are um, pivoting in ways that are sensitive to our audiences and smart as far as our strategy. And then also once the campaign is in market, my team is also involved with the evaluation of the campaign to see if we are meeting our goals when it comes to who is aware of the campaign um, and if people are changing their attitudes and behaviors as we sought out to. 
That's awesome. So I understand that you're a frequent Suzy user. Um, <laughs> I am. I'd love, to hear, great, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you use Suzy recently for a really important piece of research for high school equivalency campaign. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. So um, a little background on the issue in the campaign, maybe first. Um, yep. There are over 34 million adults in this country who don't have a high school diploma. And um, we know that that can lead to lifetime lower earnings, um, lower quality of life over time. And so our campaign um, aims to encourage people to take that first step to getting their high school diploma, um, their GED or their high school equivalency um, by finding free adult education classes near them. And our campaign and our campaign um, website connects them to those resources. Wow, it's a really important campaign. Um, yes. Yeah, what was the process um, of targeting the, the audience that you actually needed for this piece of research? Um, so for this research, um, we wanted to know more about the current barriers that our audience was facing. Um, you know, we are in a brand new era um, of, you know, living in a pandemic. We also didn't know if there were any other new barriers that had popped up over the years. So first, we wanted to target our audience. Um, in Suzy, and that was actually really easy because we just had to do a few clicks and we had adults 18 plus who hadn't graduated from high school. Um, and with a lot of other panels or you know quick user research, we sometimes struggle to find um, this audience or to reach enough people for this um, for this research. And in, in this case, we had no trouble being able to get enough people for this type of qualitative research. That's great. So from the feedback that you received, did you make any changes to the ad campaign based on that feedback? So we didn't make um, changes to the existing work, um, but we were in a phase of development for the campaign where we were able to use all of these insights to then inform how we would proceed with the development of the next round of work. So it was um, really important to be able to inform our next steps in the research, um, the types of questions we asked when we went to audiences and interviewed them, and also uh, in developing what our, our calls to action would be, our taglines, and um, the new approach for the work. Yeah, that's great. And so how quickly did you go to market with the ad campaign after that initial piece of research? So we didn't go too quickly. We actually took our time. We um, did this research, and then our next step was to take the findings from the SUSE study um, and hone our questions when we actually interviewed our target audience. Um, and once we had all of that information combined, we were able to then um, go to market and actually create a campaign that was using all of those insights um, and leveraging what we had learned here. Um, and honestly, if we didn't have this Susie as a capability, we probably would have had a lot of assumptions that we would just have to leave untested. And this allowed us to feel good about um, our next steps and that we were testing any assumptions that we had. Yeah, that's great. Assume nothing, validate everything is the <laughs> game. Um, what types of questions did you actually ask around the perceptions of adult education centers? Yeah, so we asked about um, adult education centers first saying, you know, what do you know about them? What do you not know about them? Um, what would prevent you from contacting an adult education center and what would motivate you to do so? Um, and then anything that any attitudes or be um, that they might have had about adult education centers, attitudes or perceptions. And, and then finally, we were able to actually show them one of our print ads and then ask them um, if there was anything missing, like what they still needed to know after seeing that ad in order to actually engage with the center. Mm -hmm. That's great. Did you find anything surprising in the results that then altered the messaging you used? I would say the first thing that was surprising for us was that, you know, in the campaign, we talk a lot about adult education centers. And we found in this study that people didn't actually know much about adult education centers. Um, they had a lot of questions about what they are, what they offer, who goes to them, who uses them, are they free, is their cost, you know, all kinds of sorts of questions that um, people had about adult education centers that we just assumed that was common knowledge. So that was uh, an assumption that we certainly, um, I'm glad we tested. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then my final question, 
what's going to give you confidence in your business decisions when you're when you're working forward? Definitely having data is what makes me um, confident in our decisions um, because I always want to make sure that we're proceeding in a way that is rooted in data that is informed, um, that is taking um, our audience, um, keeping our audience in mind at all times because you know my biggest fear really is that Um, when we develop a campaign, we'll create something that is either ineffective or confusing or even potentially insensitive. Um, And so having the ability to test all of our assumptions before we actually make our next move gives me a lot of confidence that we'll actually create meaningful work. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Rochelle. It was really great knowing you and really glad we're helping you create that meaningful work. Thank (laughs) Thank you. you. For the final stage in our product development life cycle, we're going to take a deeper look into in-market performance support, which enables you to understand category consumers, tracking their changes over time, and how to impact channel distribution. So for this final stage, we're going to chat with one of Susie's very own, Mary Emerson Baker. Hi, Mary. Hi, Katie. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So you've done a lot of work in this space in your career. Could you share your opinion as to how this fits with the go-to-market pillar philosophy and how clients can benefit from this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, From my perspective, um, with all of the work done in the prior pillars from foundational innovation and, you know, communications and campaign development, it, it is very fitting to then get to the stage where all of these efforts can be me- can be measured in market. So um, brand tracking is a is just a natural parlay from all of that work and to understand how you're doing based on all the effort you have put in prior. That's great. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Okay, so absolutely. Um, so I've been involved with this tracking process across industries, topics, and pillars. Um, one that comes to mind uh, strongly is one that we had done for a packaged food client who was interested in understanding the awareness of their recently launched brand um, and then tracking it over time based on the efforts they were putting into marketing and, and such. Um, in doing so, they, they did see results trend um, in, a, in a growth in an upward way. Um, they were able to identify the impact of the multiple marketing strategies and ad campaigns over time. But also one really interesting part is that they were also able to identify some competitive performance changes as well. Um, this led to their targeting and acquiring a competitive sh- a competitor's shelf space and actually driving success more quickly and even further. So it was a very exciting, exciting time for that client. That's great. So what advice would you give to brands around market performance and tracking? I would, I would emphasize that it is a really critical part of a full business strategy development process, right? Go to market. Um, with so much effort, again, put in to those pillars prior and all of the work they do from, um, you know, talking to consumers, understanding needs, uh, developing the right positioning and way in, um, it absolutely makes sense to measure that success in market in a way that it is not, de- not only tied to sales, but also from a brand awareness standpoint, um, a consideration standpoint, um, willingness to recommend, all of those things, you know, also measure success in different ways. Um, The other thing that I would keep in mind um, is the cadence at which we launch these trackers. Um, We have a lot of clients come to us and say, we would like to launch this on a monthly basis. Uh, We typically push back a little bit on that, but really try to get under the hood on their objectives, who their key key stakeholders are, why they would like to measure it on a monthly basis, because even though the consumers are changing very quickly, we don't often see monthly changes, except for a very rare category. And a lot of times it's due to, you know, something like the pandemic or, um, so we do see it occasionally, but it is not a, a, it is not a norm. So we actually recommend either quarterly, uh, biannually, or even annually, depending upon the brand, the category, uh, and the objective. Um, and the, the last thing I would uh, encourage clients to think about is the uh, different demographic segments that they would like to look at. We do see differences um, 
by segment oftentimes in the tracking process. And what that does is give them the opportunity to uh, pivot and shift to either, you know, understand why we're dropping in a particular segment or we're gaining. It's important to understand both of those. And then again, feed that back into the broader process and adjust accordingly. That's great. And so what about overall brand health tracking? Brand health tracking goes a bit deeper and a bit broader um, than just a typical tracker. Um, it looks at um, attributes, category attributes, uh, purchases, or consideration over time, just a more holistic look at the brand and the competitors and the industry as a whole. Um, as an, you know, it, as part of that, it really does tie back to that initial pillar understanding and that foundational research. And uh, brand health really ties into the whole go-to-market funnel because it really covers all of those, right? And can be tied back into um, the process for all pillars. Right. And then how has kind of shopper tracking research and category research really changed over the last couple of years? Well, you know, they've become more accessible, honestly, um, more timely, more structured, more indicative of market factors at any given point of time. When there's a time lag in a tracker, um, it really um, is less um, intuitive as far as what is impacting those metrics. Um, so if we can stick to a point in time, it really does make a big difference as far as teasing out what is driving those numbers, either up or down. Um, and it's much better from an uh, analytical and insightful uh, perspective. Great. And so in what way can agile tools really help brands to work more effectively at this particular stage of the life cycle? Yeah, again, that point in time rate is so important. Um, it's more, um, it's approving the ability to understand what's happening in that market at that point in time. Um, but it also allows clients to um, look at that in a timely fashion, follow up with some of those consumers to understand. And again, in real time, pivot their marketing strategy and potential um, innovation strategy to meet the needs of, market, uh, of the market going forward. Right. So what advice would you give to brands that have taken their product through the entire life cycle? What are the most important kind of learnings and takeaways? I would say change is inevitable, um, especially in today's world. Um, we are, you know, consumers are changing and pivoting faster than ever. I would just say continue to research, assume nothing and be flexible and enough to iterate throughout the process. Um, and you will be successful as long as you stay in tune with your consumer. Yeah. And so we asked this final question to all of our guest speakers. So I'm adapting it a little bit for you, but what is the one thing that brands need in order to give them confidence in their business decisions? I would say reliable information. And then going back to that consumer pulse um, in the changing world at, as that we live in at the moment, um, just always, always seek to understand your consumer um, and new market uh, potential and you'll, you'll do well. Great. Thanks, Mary. And thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon. We hope that you learned some valuable lessons that you can put into practice in your own work. If you have any questions for us, please reach out to our team. And we're looking forward to seeing many of you tomorrow at the Lunch and Learn session of our program. See you next time.